just going to get started now with our first talk from Professor Jeremy Holmes. So for 35 years, Professor Holmes was a consultant psychiatrist and medical psychotherapist at University College London, and then in North Devon and chair of psychotherapy, chair, chair of the psychotherapy faculty of the Royal College of Psychiatrists from 1998 until 2002. He is visiting professor at the University of Exeter and lectures nationally and internationally. In addition to 200 plus peer reviewed papers and chapters in the fields of psychoanalysis and attachment theory, his books include John Bowlby and Attachment Theory, The Oxford Textbook of Psychotherapy, Exploring Insecurity, The Therapeutic Imagination, Attachment and Therapeutic Practice, and most recently, The Brain Has a Mind of Its Own, which he will give a talk on today. In 2009, Professor Holmes received the Bowlby Ainsworth Founders Award for his contributions to attachment theory and research. In his spare time, he enjoys making music, gardening, engaging in green politics, and spending time with his grandchildren. So this is this is Professor Holmes' third engagement with the Weekend University, and I'm sure you'll agree it's an absolute it's a, it's a delight to have him back. So, Professor Holmes, whenever you're ready, you can just get started there, and and we'll get going. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Now, can you can everyone hear me? All right. Um, if you can't, if you can't, let that now know, and um, I'll just make a few introductory comments you may notice a slightly pink background that's not my favorite color but i'm in a rented or we're in a rented accommodation at the moment for a short time and this is the little girl's bedroom which i've turned into my study um and um to, i wanted to add one or two slides but um last minute thoughts but now I said that's not possible so i'm just going to make one or two general comments and give you a bit of a roadmap for the talks I say talks because in a way my talk falls into two halves. So we're going to have the first half is going to be about attachment and the second half is going to be about recent advances in neurobiology. And I'm, I'm hoping that both of these will um, provide some discussion and throw some light on the subject of integration in psychotherapy or a meta approach to psychotherapy, however one wants to uh, use that word. Now, the, 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 the slide I'm not showing you um, would be to do with, or would be expanding on the, the, just one word, and that word is consilience. And consilience is a really interesting concept in science, um, and essentially it's um, suggesting that different scientific approaches are describing or relevant to a single phenomenon. And consilience is a big issue in, let's say, uh, um, astrolo astronomy, so that we've got molecular uh, physics, um, nuclear physics, um, well, astronomy itself, we've got chemistry, all these different disciplines contribute to a kind of view and an understanding of the universe. And I'm wanting to suggest that this term consilience also applies to psychotherapy, and that we have lots of different approaches to psychotherapy, but there may be a kind of deep um, uh, understanding of the phenomenon which can emerge from different facets um, and different theoretical approaches. And I'm hoping that today, and you're giving up a whole Sunday, which I think is a heroic thing to do, although it is a bit damp where I'm living, um, uh, will be an example of that because we've got someone coming from an attachment, a psychoanalytic, um, to some extent, a neuroscience approach. We've got someone coming from a more cognitive behavioral approach, and we've got someone coming from a sort of compassion focused approach. And um, consilience is an interesting word because it actually means jumping together. So there's a kind of leap of faith involved in, in consilience also, that one has to, in one sense, leave one's theoretical background and preconceptions behind and make a kind of leap. Um, holding hands as it were with other disciplines in the hope that will uh, this will help one to understand the phenomena and i'll expand on that idea a bit later in the course of the morning in terms of integration um actually um now i didn't list that but i, I did do a book on uh, integration and psychotherapy a few years back which with my colleague anthony bateman um and uh, um if we think about integration we can think about it at a number of different levels. And I think, in a way, what I'm going to be addressing today is integration at a theoretical level. Um, 
it's quite interesting if you ask psychotherapists are you um, uh, integrative or not um the more than 50 percent usually say that they are now what one means by integrative is for debate does it mean common theoretical approach does it mean kind of horses for courses so i'll do family therapy if that's indicated or couple therapy or individual therapy or does it mean kind of combining um, different theoretical approaches, as in, for instance, Anthony Ryle's cognitive analytic therapy, where he quite explicitly says, well, we're going to use analytic techniques, we're going to be focusing on transference, but we're also going to use cognitive techniques, um, including written communications and homework. Okay, well, that's those are a few sort of theoretical uh, or general remarks. Now, let's see if I can make this work. Yes, so attachment neurobiology and the new science of psychotherapy. So I'm suggesting the new science of psychotherapy would be this kind of deep understanding of psychotherapy. And my talk's kind of falling into two halves, an attachment half and a neurobiology half. So the first half is going to be attachment. Oh, a few more general remarks. Yes, well, I'm sure most or all of you are familiar with this famous um, uh, metaphor that the uh, psychotherapy researcher, Lester Laborski, described or came up with, I think it was in 1974, that does seem a very long time ago, I'm sure before most of the of you, whoever you are, this is the awful thing about Zoom lecturing, I can't see your faces, I can't have a sort of sense of who you are, and probably you can't really have a sense of who I am, because um, you're only seeing my, my mugshot. Um, anyway, Lester Laborski, famous psychotherapy researcher, drew on Alice in Wonderland, and for those of you who just, I'm sure you all know Alice in Wonderland, but just to remind you, Alice falls asleep. She then dreams that she's falling down a rabbit hole. She goes down, 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 down. And at the bottom, uh, she arrives in this sort of cave area. And there's a whole lot of creatures that are running round and round and round and round. And then suddenly the dodo bird, the extinct dodo bird, um, blows a whistle and everyone stops running. And then Alice, who... In a way, the whole of Alice in Wonderland is a kind of a satire on Victorian values, and Victorian values definitely include the idea of winners and losers. Um, she says, well, who's won? Who's lost? And the dodo bird says, everyone has won, and all shall have prizes. And the reason why Investor Laborski brought this up as a, as a metaphor, if you like, is that although we do know that psychotherapy is effective, and this, um, I think this is incontrovertible now, um, and probably if we take mild to moderate depression as effective, if not more so than, say, antidepressants, um, but with the additional uh, benefits of having few, if any, side effects, and also having uh, a kind of a post-treatment increase in uh, health, um, it's very hard, despite what our cognitive behavioural therapy colleagues say, um, to demonstrate that one form of psychotherapy is generally and universally superior to any other. So there is a sense in which everyone has won and will actually have prizes. Now, this has to be um, tempered, this view, I think, because we know, for instance, that psychoanalytic psychotherapy is not very effective in a severe OCD, whereas cognitive behavioural therapy can produce some quite good results. Um, in my opinion, and I think that the evidence supports this, on the whole, psychoanalytic psychotherapy is not particularly effective in uh, psychotic disorders, and a more supportive um, approach is appropriate there. So, uh, although Lester Borsky was onto something, and the dodo bird verdict uh, still holds, um, it's uh, possibly there are some um, exceptions, let's put it that way. Now, if we're thinking about integration in psychotherapy and consilience um, and a kind of meta approach, then we have what um, I like to call the Esperanto problem. Again, some of you may not be familiar with this, but in a, <clears throat> I think it was in the 1920s, um, long, long, long before the European community and Brexit, etc. Um, it, it was thought, well, we're all European, um, but we all speak different languages and uh, we need to have a common European language. And so this term, this, this language was kind of invented to de, de novo, um, and it was given the name Esperanto, which of course is a very good name, means hope. Um, and um, 
I mean, the interesting thing about uh, Esperanto is that practically nobody speaks it. Um, we all speak our, uh, our mother tongue. And this, in a way, is the problem about, certainly about integration in psychotherapy. I know that isn't exactly the topic of the day, but in a way it's, it abuts to it, which is that as psychotherapists, we kind of have a mother tongue. In my case, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, it may be integrative psych, it may be um, cognitive behavioral therapy, it may be systemic therapy, family therapy, maybe group analytic therapy, etc. So we all kind of grow up in a particular psychotherapy environment. Uh, my, my view is that um, in order to be an effective sort of um, broad spectrum psychotherapist, one probably needs a kind of major and a minor discipline. In other words, well, perhaps I'm just describing and generalizing from my own case that although I've brought up as a psychoanalytic psychotherapist, I've always been very keen on integration. Um, I've had training in a uh, couple and family therapy, and I've always worked closely with cognitive behavioral therapists um, while at the same time maintaining a kind of distance and a boundary. Um, the whole idea of a mother tongue is an interesting one. This is a bit of an aside. I'm afraid I'm a bit of an aside person, so you've got a few asides in the course of my talk. Um, because uh, I, I, uh, one way of thinking about the mother tongue is that it's actually a kind of cultural anomaly. Um, and it's us monoglot English speakers, particularly in the UK, but I think it to some extent applies in the US as well, much less in the US, of course. Um, but if you look worldwide, most people actually are um, uh, able to speak more than one language. And in some, I believe, in some Borneo uh, hill, hillside um, communities, um, children may be able to speak five or six different languages because each different village has its own dialect at least. So the, the idea of a basic or mother tongue is something that one might want to question. Okay, let's get on and talk about attachment. So I'm suggesting, and I'm going to try and justify this, that we can think about a, a attachment as a meta perspective for all psychotherapies. And the, it's, it's the idea of a deep grammar. Um, this is a concept um, that I think Noam uh, no Chomsky uh, built his reputation around again in the 1970s. So Chomsky um, was interested in linguistics. He realized that there are, I don't know how many languages there are in the world, I'm several thousand, um, might be 9,000, um, but um, they all have, as it were, a deep underlying uh, common structure. And his idea is that that deep underlying common structure is actually built into, the, into our nervous system. And um, if we think about uh, psychotherapy in terms of, on the one hand, caring, and on the other hand, change, um, and if we think that the human psyche needs both this caring phenomenon in order to survive and to be able to adapt to different circumstances, therefore to change, and a kind of repair mechanism when things go wrong, then we could imagine that there might be a kind of deep grammar um, of psychotherapy, which applies uh, across the board to uh, all forms of psychotherapy. So I'm going to suggest that attachment can provide a kind of integrative framework thinking about, um, let's call it better psychotherapy for the moment. And one way of thinking about this is, to, is the idea that virtually all, if not all, effective therapies have three key components. A therapeutic relationship and an understanding of a therapeutic relationship. Some kind of explanatory framework. So an understanding of what psychological health is, what psychological ill health is, and how one tries to help our clients move from psychological ill health towards health. And that leads us to the third component, which is techniques for promoting change. So I'm going to divide this part of the talk um, under those three headings. So let's have a look first at a therapeutic relationship and how we understand that and how that understanding might inform our work as psychotherapists. Perhaps I should say, um, I, I see myself primarily as a clinician and I always say and think, if you're going to give up your Sunday for an event like this, in the end, you want to know, is this going to change my practice? Is this going to help me with that difficult patient that I'm going to sit down with or will be lying on my couch on 
uh, Monday morning. So I hope that that angle is going to come through from what I'm talking about. So how does attachment theory think about or theorize relationship? And these are some of the themes I'm going to uh, uh, address. I won't um, go through that in detail because I'm going to say something about each of those um, the six topics. So what do we mean by the attachment dynamic? Well, this was John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth's basic um, discovery, if you like. The idea that um, if you take early man evolving both physically but also psychologically subject to evolutionary pressures um, in the old by gorge in what we now call Ethiopia or Kenya, this early man and woman is a rather unusual species. We can't run very fast. We haven't got very sharp teeth or claws. We've really only got two assets but they are huge assets number one we've got big brains and number two we've got each other and bobby and robert hind who was an evolutionary a colleague of his their idea was that in this what they call environment of evolutionary adaptation the attachment dynamic would be necessary because to get that big brain through the birth canal we have to be born in a state of huge immaturity. If you think of a newborn lamb, it's a bit late in the year now to see newborn lambs, but a newborn lamb's up and running within half an hour or less of birth, and it takes us a whole year. So we're very, very immature, and we're therefore very, very vulnerable to predation. And in order to protect us from predation, from predators, we need an old, what Bowlby and Ainsworth called an older, wiser caregiver. We need somebody who's going to protect us, look after us, pick us up when we're in danger. And so we need behavioral mechanisms to ensure that. And the attachment dynamics suggests that when we are, particularly when we're young, but it applies as adults as well, applies throughout life, when we're threatened or tired or ill, we then seek out a secure base. We seek out a caregiver and this is a reciprocal relationship because that caregiver when confronted with threat illness or exhaustion in a care seeker their attachment dynamic is activated and they will want to protect that child so i'm sure all of us have had the or it isn't just a child it might be a fellow um, a member of a different species but i'm sure we've all seen a little baby bird that's fallen out of the nest and we can't just walk by it. We immediately, our caregiving um, uh, dynamic is activated and we need to pick that little baby bird up and put it in the matchbox and feed it um, some cat food. By the way, it's a very wonderful way of feeding a, a fledgling um, a baby bird. So this is the attachment dynamic, typically between parents and children and spouses, but also close siblings. And it's an interesting and debatable issue, but um, there is a, a kind of horizontal attachment dynamic, uh, because if we think of the way I described it, it's kind of vertical, a horizontal attachment dynamic, possibly between military uh, buddies um, who need to protect each other in that kind of way. And the question, the big question is, does this also apply between therapists and patients? And that's something which we can debate, but I think we can... Uh, assume that aspects of the attachment dynamic do apply to therapists and patients, and this has significant therapeutic uh, implications, as I hope will emerge. I think I've said all that. Um, now, there are two points on this slide that I want to emphasize. The first is the reciprocal or mutually exclusive relationship between the attachment dynamic and exploration of one's world. And this is um, the basis of the strange situation procedure, which was invented and developed by, by uh, Mary Ainsworth, John Bilby's colleague, and forms the gold standard for assigning category of secure or insecure attachment and the various forms of insecure attachment. And what this consists of, just to remind you, is um, a caregiver, a parent usually, 
and a child. They're invited into the laboratory. It's a nice warm room. There are toys on the floor. There's an experimenter there and a couple of chairs. And uh, let's call her mum and baby, one-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old, sit down, start chatting. The baby gets off mum's knee, starts crawling around and exploring. And then that baby is exposed to threat. And the threat is the mother goes out of the room for three minutes. Now, if you're a one-year-old in a strange situation, then a three-minute separation from your caregiver is extremely threatening and dangerous. That activates the attachment dynamic. The child stops playing, goes to the door, starts to cry. And when mum comes back, that child will express quite a bit of distress and maybe even anger. And in secure attachment, that baby is soothed by the mother. The attachment dynamic subsides and then um, all is well, and that child, I'm sorry about this binging, and I'm not able to stop it, but I, uh, I just have to apologise for it. I thought I had stopped it. Um, that baby then um, is able to resume exploratory play. Now, I think this is highly relevant to us as psychotherapists, whatever our um, uh, background, whether we're systemic or cognitive or psychoanalytic, when a client comes into our room, we have to think that that is quite threatening. Um, in the early stages, we're strangers, but not only that, um, you're kind of in a way expected to expose your vulnerability. And so the attachment dynamic may be applicable, particularly at the beginning of sessions and in the early stages of therapy. The same applies at the end of therapy because you're, as it were, handing that client back to him or herself and you're no longer there to protect them. So one of my principles, rightly or wrongly, is no interpretations in the first or the last five minutes of a session. Um, because interpretation is exploration. And the client is in a state of attachment dynamic and therefore not really able to explore. That's the first point from this slide. The second point from the slide I want to bring out is that phrase, only mum will do. Now, the reason I mention this is um, uh, I have to confess that I have now retired from the National Health Service, but I think this is hugely misunderstood in current health service terms, in that health service provision is seen in purely technical terms. It's what I call the supermarket model. The idea is that you've got a problem, like depression, might be diabetes, and you simply go to your health professional uh, setup and they dole out whatever it is that you need, and you go away again, just like when you go and you need a pint of milk from the supermarket. The attachment dynamic says only mum will do, and I think the same applies to general practice, and it's very hard to maintain continuity for a patient with their GP. And even in the health, even mental health services, you may see a different uh, community psychiatric nurse from one week to the next. So the, the specificity is one aspect of uh, the attachment dynamic that I think has got lost in our culture. Um, that's a rather cynical way of putting the whole thing. I put this for Nile, in for Niall's sake, um, uh, although, of course, George Bernard Shaw was a Protestant Catholic, a Protestant Irishman, but um, in his uh, inimitable way, he did capture some aspect of this specificity of the attachment relationship. Now, a really important theme for um, I, I, by the way, I should, I've apologised at least once, and this is my second, if not third, apology coming, but I'm sure a lot of this is very familiar to all of you, but just think of it as a kind of revision. Um, now, what Bowlby uh, wanted to, when Bowlby was developing attachment theory, he kind of had a bit of a battle with the psychoanalytic uh, community within which he uh, had been trained. I mean, Bowlby was a definite consilience person because one of his complaints about psychoanalysis was that there was no consilience. There was no interest in other disciplines other than psychoanalysis itself. And really, attachment theory can be thought of as a kind of cross-fertilization uh, between psychoanalysis on the one hand and the emerging, emerging science of ethology on the other. And one of the issues was, where does the relationship, the intense relationship between parent, particularly mother and child, come from? And in the psychoanalytic world, this was seen in terms of infantile sexuality and essentially um, in terms of feeding. 
Now, what Bowlby uh, emphasised, partly, I think, my next slide will show this, um, with the help of his friend Harry Harlow, who was studying monkey behaviour, was that um, there are two dynamics. There's a need for food. Of course, every infant needs to go to the breast, but at the uh, uh, or the bottle. But there's also a need for this intimacy, this closeness, this attachment relationship. And this is the famous, well, this is a rather blurry illustration from a famous study of rhesus monkeys, where Harry Harlow offered these um, small monkeys a choice between a wire mother that had a bottle sticking out and a kind of terry nappy mother that they could cuddle up to, but where they wouldn't get any food. And he then measured the amount of time they spent on each of these um, uh, surrogate mothers, if you like, and they spent far more time on the cuddly terry mother, uh, nappy, um, terry nappy mother than the bottle mother. So this attachment dynamic needs to be seen as a kind of uh, psychological module, if you like, in its own right. I think that's the way we would look at it now. Now, we need to think in relational terms here. So as psychotherapists, what is our skill, if you like? Our skill is the relational skill. The psychoanalyst uh, uh, Michael Barlind wrote a famous book called The Doctor, His Patient and the Illness. And he was particularly interested in the ways in which general practitioners can offer a degree of psychotherapy for their patients. And as he put it, the drug is doctor. The question is, in what dose and how frequently? So what we need to think about is, what are the components of a therapeutic relationship? And I think we can transpose what we understand about the components of the parent-child relationship into the therapeutic setting. And the re psychology researcher Ruth Feldman has developed this concept of what she calls biobehavioral synchrony. And she's measuring the physiology of mother and infant or father and infant in the early weeks and months of life and shows how there is a kind of synchronous, particularly in what we would think of as secure attachment, there's a kind of synchrony at a physiological level as well as at a psychological level. And I'm just going to illustrate some aspects of this. The fundamental physiology depends on oxytocin. Now, we all know that oxytocin levels are very high at the moment of birth. But what Ruth Feldman has shown is that the, in secure attachment, there's a synchrony, there's a mirroring, if you like, between the oxytocin levels in the caregiver, usually mother, but it can be a primary caregiver father, in, say, in gay relationships, and the infant. And where the mother's oxytocin levels are high, the infant's oxytocin levels are high. And if you compare insecure attachment with secure attachment, you'll find that the general levels in insecure attachment of oxytocin tend to be lower, and this synchrony is also disrupted. And oxytocin triggers or cross talks to, if you like, the reward system. And as we all know, there's something, as it were, irresistible about a sweet little newborn baby. Now, what does that mean? It means that our dopaminergic systems and pathways are being activated as well. Um, now, this is an interesting issue for us as psychotherapists, because, of course, we do, whether we like it or not, have patients that we really enjoy seeing. And then we ha have what um, is probably politically utterly incorrect to use this phrase, um, but in the old days used to be called heart sync patients, patients where it's very difficult, as it were, to enjoy spending 50 minutes or an hour in the same room with this, such a patient. Now, that's an interesting point, which I'm going to come back to a bit later on. I'm going to go on. What is important is that this biobehavioral synchrony in the first few weeks and months of life has long-term consequences. And so that where, if you measure a level of biobehavioral synchrony in the first six months of life, say, follow those children up into school entry, you'll find that those children where the synchrony is high a greater empathic behaviour and general social competence. So again, we have to think, and I think we're only just beginning to work in this way, there is some research now, 
um, looking at the therapeutic analogues of this. So, for instance, you can measure heart rate and skin conductance in the therapist and in patients and look at the correlations between the two. We may come on to that a bit later. I show this slide partly because it was developed by a um, biologist, Waddington, who was a friend of Bowlby's. The basic point about this slide is that our clients come to each come to see us, they're on a kind of developmental pathway. They, and typically, of course, if they come in search of therapy, it's going to be a developmental pathway that's causing them grief and pain and difficulty. And our job, as it were, is to help move that client into a more healthy, a more satisfying developmental pathway, where, as it were, the environment is benign and therefore brings out the best in them. And we have to think, whatever our particular psychiatry, therapy model is how we set about doing that. And these developmental pathways are not immutable, but they are self-perpetuated and they're reproduced in intimate relationships. And this is, I think, a sort of fundamental concept that whether we like it or not, um, or whether we're resistant to this idea, I think this is one of the fundamental contributions to consilience, if you like, that comes from psychoanalytic psychotherapy, the idea that our clients have inbuilt relational dispositions which they're going to reproduce in their relationship with us. Sensitivity. Those of you who are involved in psychotherapy training, either as trainees or trainers, will have to face the question of how do we select people are suitable for training as psychotherapists. And in an informal way, of course, we tend to be asked by friends and family for recommendations for a therapist. Our friend's daughter's got an eating disorder. Can you recommend someone or help her? That sort of thing. I would say some of the, uh, one of the issues, if you like, in meta psychotherapy is the question of what's more important the technique or the personality of the therapist in an ideal world i would say both but they certainly are of equal importance so what is it about the psychotherapist that makes one recommend x and not recommend y i would say Attachment does have something interesting to say about this. And Mary Ainsworth was certainly very interested in asking the question, okay, we, we've got one-year-olds or one-and-a-half-year-olds, we can classify them as securely or insecurely attached. What's happened in that first year or so of life of those infants that has, as it were, led to this outcome? And the key word that she honed in on was sensitivity. And here's her definition of sensitivity, timely and appropriate responsiveness to infant's distress, the capacity to read and regulate children's and one's own emotional states. And I will uh, um, expand on that in a minute, but I just want to pick up in a way, a key point about negative affect here, because go back to what I was saying about the heart sink patient. One of the key differences between the parents of securely attached children and insecurely attached children is that the parents of securely attached children <clears throat> are not, as it were, phased, so I'm just going to have a drink of water, by their infant's distress. And I'll show you some slides to illustrate this. So parents of insecurely attached children may well be quite good parents, but as it were, they're fair weather parents. When that child is distressed or angry, where there's a problem, they tend to switch off. They tend to reject the child. They tend to push the child away. And I think the same applies to us as therapists. One of the key features of effective therapists is that we are, as it were, not put off by distress, by we may be distressed, but we're able to metabolize our distress, our very difficult times. So we can learn something from this attachment. Uh, conceptualization. This is a, a, 
um, and it may seem a bit of an irrelevant picture, but it's one that I like anyway. And what it's illustrating is some work by Gergely and Watson that was done um, quite about 20 years ago now, where they studied mothers and infants um, in a kind of naturalistic way. And what they noticed was that in the first six months of life or so, mothers and infants in the course of a day have several periods of intense mutual gaze. And in these periods <coughs> of mutual gaze, there are two lasting for not very long, maybe 30 seconds, there are two key features which they call contingency and marking. Now, contingency is the way in which the caregiver, usually the mother, but it can be the father or grandparent, waits for the child to make the first move. So the mother's response is contingent on whatever it is that the infant brings. And the second feature, marking, is that the parent's response kind of exaggerates or underlines whatever it is that the infant is inverted commas saying. So these um, uh, uh, periods of mutual gaze are really conversations, they're pre-verbal conversations. And in these pre-verbal conversations, um, the infant is, as it were, learning something. What are they learning? They're learning what their feelings are. Now, I believe it, we can think of it like this. So here's the little baby. Mum picks up baby, looks at the baby, so her response is going to be contingent. She notices that the baby's a little bit miserable mouth slightly downturned, perhaps eyes averted. The mother then responds in a contingent way, but in a marked or exaggerated contingent way. So she'll say, oh, we are feeling a bit miserable today, aren't we? Something like that. Now, what happens? That infant is seeing in front of his or her eyes, his or her own feelings reflected back. <clears throat> so the mother, and this is something that Winnicott got on to long before attachment theory was really got going. The mother is the mirror in which the infant first begins to see his or her feelings. That visualization of his or her feelings, it's not just physical, but it's also auditory, is then internalized. So the child is beginning, as it were, to develop a picture of his or her feelings and in order to live in this hyper-social world that we find ourselves in of other human beings, we need to be able to factor in our own feelings as well as theirs. So this is all really important. And I believe it applies or can be conciliate. We can use consilience. We can do this jumping together from that concept into the consulting room. Because what do we do as therapists? Well, certainly as analytic therapists, we're very contingent. We don't say very much at the beginning of the session. We may say nothing, or we may make some sort of hum and ha kind of remark. We wait for the client to make the first move. And even if you're a cognitive behavioral therapist, you know, you might just say, well, how was your week? And then wait, an open question. So we do this consistence, and then we respond. And we respond often with this underlining. So we might say, wow, that was quite a week. Or, mm, goodness. So we're underlining. We're reflecting back to the client whatever it is that they've brought. So in one sense, all therapies represent or can be seen in terms of this mirroring process where the client is gradually beginning to know themselves and particularly to know their affective selves. Um, this is Winnicott's um, take on this. And from this, of course, this famous concept of the false self emerges because that process of contingency and marking may be disrupted. Let's say the caregiver is miserable, depressed herself, uh, intoxicated with alcohol, uh, taking drugs, just had a terrible row, worried about their, uh, how they're going to pay the next bill, whatever it happens to be, their capacity for mirroring may be impaired. And therefore the child will, as it were, have a difficulty in differentiating his feelings from those of the mother. I like to give this picture to illustrate this. This is a triptych by the 20th century painter Francis Bacon, one of the great painters of the 20th century, who had a very disturbed childhood and was himself very disturbed and alcoholic, but still a great painter. And I think this might be the kind of distorted mirroring that one might see, particularly perhaps in disorganized attachment, um, if this mirroring process is impaired. And it's so important for us as therapists to know this because 
if we have problems in our own life, of course we have problems in our own life, but if they can't be put to one side for the purposes of our work, then we're not able to offer this mirroring and it's probably best if we take a week off. I usually give the example of a supervisee of mine who had a, a quite a bad car crash uh, over a weekend. She herself was fine physically, but her car was written off and she was very shaken by this and she just decided to take a week off. And I admired her for this because I don't think I, um, I would have done that. And I think the reason she decided to take the week off because she felt that she would not, as it were, be able to exclude her own feelings of threat, etc., from the session. And so this is the Winnicott idea that what the compliant full self baby is doing is all the time, as it were, trying to find out what the mother wants to see rather than to express his or her own feelings. And of course, this has therapeutic implications because we are probably familiar with clients who are, as it were, um, very good clients. They do all their homework. They turn up on time when you make a an interpretation they say oh that's so clever you know that's so true doctor and yet something doesn't seem quite right and that would be this compliant for self concept and i write well i have this very famous quote from winnicott but some of you may not have encountered it before i wouldn't read it out now this is an interesting study that's relevant here and again relevant to therapy um, Beatrice Beebe, um, who was an infancy researcher influenced by attachment theory, videotaped mothers and infants uh, in the first few months of life. And she then followed those infants up to um, the strange situation where they could be classified as securely and insecurely attached. And in um, this particular study, she um, was interested in vocalization. So a child, say four months old, is quite verbal in a kind of vocalizing way, so they'll be babbling and making interesting sounds. And her instruction to the mother was, just sing along with your baby. And she, uh, this is a rather crude uh, summary of what she found, but the mothers fell into three categories. There were those that uh, sort of were tone deaf, they just couldn't do it really. There were those that were rather obsessional, and if the baby went ba ba ba, they'd go ba ba ba. They simply repeated exactly what the baby did. And there were those that did a kind of jazzy, improvisation on the science that the baby made. And unsurprisingly, those were the ones um, that were classified as securely attached um, age one or so. So um, I, I think, again, there are implications for therapy. Um, you're probably all familiar with Rogerian therapy, which um, uh, is really an integrative therapy. And um, the Rogerian therapy in a way, is in the area of this kind of simply repeating back to the client what it is that they've said. Now, there are, there's a place for that. But if you think about what's a good session, a good session is when you have a kind of to and fro, kind of um, the client says something and then you expand on that and the client expands on what you've said. And so it goes on. You, you would never have a whole session like that. But you have a little kind of riff in a session like that. So this idea of partially contingent um, mirroring is something that follows on from the contingent mirroring. So the partial and contingent really is the second six months of life, the first six months um, would be the contingent mirroring. And all those processes, I believe, go on in all therapies and have a kind of integrative uh, uh, aspect. Now, this slide is illustrating um, the way in which our thinking about attachment, uh, I'm looking at the time, because I know that um, Naya wants us to have a break after 45 minutes. So. I think I'll go on until about 5 to 11, if that's okay, and then we'll have our break. Um, because we did start, well, I started certainly slightly after uh, 10 o'clock. Now, the point of this slide is that it goes back to what I was saying right at the beginning, that um, Bilby and Hine thought of um, attachment purely in terms of protection from predation. But um, although, of course, a newborn infant these days is still highly uh, at risk in all kinds of ways, there aren't that many cheetahs um, uh, and jaguars sort of wandering about the streets that are about to gobble them up. So one way of thinking about what's happened, as it were, is that the proximity that the original attachment dynamic introduced has now metamorphosed 
into what I'm going to develop in a minute, which is affect co-regulation. Now, the point of this slide is people say the dinosaurs are extinct, and I always tease my grandchildren and say, no, no, look out of the window and you'll see one. Birds are the evolutionary uh, successors of dinosaurs, and birds' feathers are thought to have evolved from what was originally fur that was keeping dinosaurs warm. But then those dinosaurs that had long bits of fur and could flap their forearms or forelimbs rather could then escape from predation. And hey presto, they're suddenly in a new environment which they can then exploit, which is the air, as it were. And what we're seeing, or what we've seen in humans, is that we're in a new environment, which is the human environment, a collaborative environment, and collectively we can achieve huge amounts in a way our evolutionary success depends on our collective capacity to work as a team, to work together. This we can think of as having evolved rather as birds' feathers evolved from dinosaurs' fur. So I think we now move on to affect regulation, affect co-regulation. And this, for us as therapists, is such a key issue that we all the time are co-regulating our affect. And, oh dear, I wish that would stop. Um, so, and that co-regulation of affect is uh, interfered with in insecure attachment. Uh, Bowlby actually was aware of that. So, uh, um, the feeding situation provides an opportunity to gauge a mother's sensitivity to her baby's single signals. This whole question of sensitivity, timing, and in a way, the social relationship. So let's move on and give some illustration of this cap, uh, affect co-regulation. So in the first four years of life, parent-infant co-regulation, then by the time a child is around four, they're beginning to be able to regulate their own um, uh, uh, feelings to some extent. I usually like to give the example of the child who goes to school um, and um, for the first day, let's say, and falls over and grazes his or, grazes his or her knee in the playground. And then mum or dad comes to pick up the kid at three o'clock or 3.15, says, oh, little Johnny was so brave, he fell over and I put a plaster on, he was terribly brave. And then mum or dad takes little Johnny into the car or walks him or her home. And the moment they get home, they burst into tears. And this is the way in which we still, the attachment dynamic doesn't disappear. It kind of goes underground, but in the presence of a caregiver, then we are able, as it were, to co-regulate our affect. Um, and we still have this hidden regulation, even in adulthood, I usually used to ask, because I'm primarily an adult psychotherapist, so I'd ask my clients, okay, you're run over by the pro proverbial London bus, you end up in a uh, hospital, who is the first person that we're going to ring uh, or contact and say that, you're not, uh, that you've had this accident? And that will be the, um, the secure base figure for that individual, maybe husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, um, grandmother, mother, father, could even be, as it were, once dog, um, there's always got to be a key figure who plays that role in a person's life. And this doesn't just apply to negative affect, it applies to positive affect as well. So you might say, well, what happens? Who do you ring when you um, discover that you're pregnant or have passed your exam um, or have got into university, or whatever it happens to be, some positive event in your life? Again, the person that you want to contact will be that key um, uh, secure basic individual. So I'm just going to show some examples of this. I said I'd stop in a minute. Um, this is a really, uh, some of you will have seen this. It's on YouTube. I do recommend it. It's a wonderful um, little video by Edtronic. And what Edtronic did was um, develop something called the still face paradigm. The strange situation I described to you, can't do the strange situation with a four month year old baby. What you do is the still face paradigm. You put mother and baby together and then they're playing, uh, looking at each other, having a proto-conversation. You then ask the caregiver to freeze their face for one minute and you observe what happens. And in this particular video, you see this lovely little boy, this beautiful mother, 
They're having a great conversation, and then the mother freezes her face, and that little boy essentially regresses to uh, babyhood, slumps in his or her chair, starts emitting very primitive sort of screechy noises as opposed to the more complex noises that a a four-month-year-old has. And what we see there is the way in which one's psychological state is essentially a collaborative one. Uh, This is an example, uh, this is a study that illustrates this point that insecure uh, attachment is associated with inability to metabolize negative affect. Um, And I'm going to just finish this sequence and then we'll have our break. So I'm arguing from this that any kind of psychotherapy situation uh, has to provide a safe space a safe space for love, and I think we can kind of anatomize love now with the help of attachment theory, which contains these components, particularly the biobehavioral synchrony, the sensitivity, but also the capacity to affect regulate, and particularly to affect regulate negative affect. And this is um, Winnicott again, famous paper, Hate and the Counter-Transference. Um, and we can apply this to psychotherapists, but this is a direct quote, however much the psychotherapist loves his patients, she can, cannot avoid hating them and fearing them. The better he knows this, the less fear and hate will be the motive. So openness to negative emotion is crucial for us as therapists. Okay, I think we'll have a break now. Um, and um, we'll start again at uh, 11. And we'll go on to 20 to 12 when we have Q&A. And I don't know whether I'm going to ask Neil to help me do something about that very irritating binging, and I do apologise for it. That's at least my third apology in the course of the war. So, time for a break. Okay, I'm going to go on now, um, even if not everybody has returned to wherever you're listening from. (laughs) Um, So, uh, um, I did a Zoom session with another organization a week or two back and at least one participant <laughs> did the entire day I think lying in bed made some very useful contributions as well okay so um let's see where we're going um let's see where we're going yes um the point about this slide and a few subsequent ones is really to suggest two points. Firstly, that the therapist has a particular role, not just in terms of metabolizing negative affect, but also providing what uh, Marvin and colleagues call narcissistic supplies. Um, Their model, which is illustrated here, is the circle of security. It's a 20 session intervention they've developed, particularly help for helping with uh, adoptive parents. And uh, there's a lot of psychoeducation in this and they try to teach attachment theory to their um, clients. And they give the example, say, of um, a caregiver, mother or father in a playground with a child and that child is kind of exploring the world, but also using the caregiver as a secure base to whom they can return. So the child um, and the, the let's say the dad in this case, sitting on a bench, park bench, the child rushes off and starts to climb up uh, the ladder that leads to the slide. And then uh, when he gets to a certain height, he feels a bit nervous. So there's a kind of threat that activates the attachment dynamic. They then look back to the caregiver for encouragement or uh, reassurance. Caregiver might say, you can do it. You're fine, that's great. You've got up to the fifth step. And so the child then is kind of pushed up by that um, uh, and is able to come down the slide and then rushes back to the caregiver, gives them a hug and says, oh, well done, and off they go again. This is the circle of security illustrated very beautifully in that little picture. And I think something similar, again, we tend to underemphasize this, but something similar is uh, present in psychotherapeutic relationships um, and it's this idea of the you can do it message. So the client, in an appropriate way, may re- receive that kind of message 
from their caregiver, whatever the model they were using. Um, so security providing parents delight in their children's very existence. So we kind of have to find some aspect of our clients that we really can delight in or admire or value. And this circle of uh, what you might call the narcissistic supply circle is provided in therapy as well. And I do believe that we as therapists quite often make these kind of positive kind of comments, although we may not tell our supervisors about them. Uh, but if we look at the, I put at the very bottom there, perhaps that illustrates the point. Now, another set of uh, experiments and studies that have been done associated with uh, Mario Michelinza and Phil Shaver of looking at subliminal messages and their relationship to attachment. And I don't know whether you, any of you can see that. Um, some of you may instantly read it. Others may think it's just scribble. But what Michelinza and Shaver have found is that if you ask subjects, they usually psychology university students, so we need to bear that in mind that it's quite culturally weird, to give an account of their week, just write a half a page about the good things and the bad things that have happened during their week. If you subject them, if you offer them a subliminal message like that, which by the way actually says mom, then the free writing that these subjects in the experiment produce tends to have more of a sense of achievement, more of a sense of negative aspects being resolved. I had a row with my boyfriend, but we made it up sort of thing. Then in those who are not exposed to this subliminal message. And again, I think this is highly relevant to us as therapists. We just take for granted the role of the setting the fact that we provide a room that's warm and quiet and free from interruption for a specified length of time is hugely important. And again, I believe this is something that's got lost, certainly in the National Health Service provision that we have uh, here. We have something called hot desking, which means you may see clients in a different room every week. And that disrupts the subliminal attachment message. So. Again, here we have a kind of um, overall concept that apply to whatever model of therapy that you're using. I think I've said all that. Now, believe it or not, we've been, I've been talking for an hour, and all I've talked about is one aspect of the uh, triad, the attachment relationship, explanatory framework, and promoting change. So let's go on and look more rapidly at second and third and what attachment has to say about this. Diagnosis is an interesting issue in psychotherapy because on the one hand, um, diagnosis is reassuring. If you know that you've got OCD, let's say, or uh, ADD, or indeed a psychotic illness, or major depressive disorder, it reduces anxiety so that thought becomes possible, so that these inchoate feelings that make you feel terrible can now be talked about. We've got a language. But of course, diagnosis also can act as a kind of block to thinking. It can reify and it can close down freshness and creativity, which is essentially what we're trying to create in our psychotherapeutic conversations. I'm going to skip over this just because of time. Uh, very briefly, um, it, in a way, it belonged to the previous uh, section anyway, but Rick, Vic, uh, I'll just say very quickly that Viktor Frankl, who invented existential psychotherapy, um, he um, had a chance to get away from Nazi invasion of Austria in the Anschluss in 1938. He could have had a job in America, but he was securely attached to his parents, so he stayed with his parents and as a result ended up in a concentration camp. In the concentration camp, he was befriended by one of the guards who had was having marital problems, and he found himself talking to this guard on the way out to their work details. He was given slightly more 
food and lighter duties as a result and say survive. Now the point I wanted to make with Viktor Frankl is that we use this word, these terms, secure and insecure attachment, and it's hard not to think of secure attachment as good and insecure attachment as bad, but actually it's entirely contextual. So that Viktor Frankl's secure attachment was actually in a sense life-threatening. He could easily have died in a concentration camp in that context, in that extreme threatening context. But on the other hand, once he was in the concentration camp, his secure attachment, capacity to be sensitive and listen to the guard meant possibly that he survived. So I'm just using this as an illustration of the issue of diagnosis, which applies across the board to all of our psychotherapies. Jay Belsky um, has uh, developed this idea of neuroplasticity, that we're looking at um, context again, and how there are uh, individuals who are kind of rather like orchids. So an orchid uh, is a very delicate plant which thrives when the hum humidity and temperature are right and does very badly when the humidity and temperature are wrong, whereas dandelions do pretty well, whatever the environmental circumstances. And many of our clients who come to us, I would say, are orchids. They've had environmental disruption or disability or difficulty. But in the therapeutic context, they may flourish. But of course, what's going on in their outside world is highly important too. The most important diagnostic category, I think, from the point of view of psychology, that... So, sorry to interrupt you, but... Um... There's a very big squeaking noise. It might be coming from the mouse or the chair or something. I'm not it's sure. It's swinging backwards and forwards on my chair, and I'm awfully sorry. I'll try and keep still. Right. No it's one of the key features, isn't it, of um, effective television communication and journalism is the capacity, and probably acting on television, is the capacity to, sta to stay still. And in a way, it's the very opposite when one's lecturing in a live situation where I think movement um, makes the whole thing a bit more interesting. So I do apologize, and I'm glad you pointed that out, Neil, and I'll try and stay still. Yes, uh, disorganized attachment um, was the main category. I'm not going to go into the details because of time, but um, disorganized attachment is a very important category, and I think many of the difficulties that our clients bring to us may be the long-term results of disorganized attachment. This was a subgroup in the normative sample that Mary May, one of Mary Ainsworth's important um, PhD students, developed. Um, she found there's a group of uh, children who she couldn't really easily classify as securely or insecurely attached, given the uh, two main categories of insecure attachment, avoidant and resistant. And then she found essentially that these were children who, where the biobehavioral synchrony between parent and child was utterly disrupted. And these will be clients when they come to see us as therapists, where the biobehavioral synchrony between us and them may be disrupted. These are the clients who um, come to see you once and then don't turn up for three sessions, who turn up late for sessions, or, as happened to me on at least one occasion, who refuse to leave at the end of sessions or where you just don't feel on the same wavelength as the client. These are the ones who represent, as it were, a massive challenge for us. And um, Mary Main's idea about this was this idea of an, appoint, a, an approach avoidance dilemma. These are often children who've been experiencing some degree of, of, of abuse. This may be um, sexual or physical abuse or maybe neglect, so an absent caregiver. And so these children have to rely as best they can on themselves, but when they're threatened, then the attachment dynamic is activated. But when that attachment uh, dynamic is activated, they turn to an attachment figure. But the attachment figure, the parent, is the very source of the threat. And so they have this attachment avoidance dilemma, and so they resort to various forms of self-soothing, affect self-regulation rather than co-regulation, and in our more uh, adolescent and adult clients, we can think of things like deliberate self-harm, risky sexual behaviour, uh, alcohol or drug addiction as, a, as it were, attempts at self-soothing in the absence of a secure base or in the presence of a secure base is the very source of the threat. And this pattern, this disorganised attachment, is very common in clinical populations, although uncommon in normative samples. So here we're talking about, as it were, a theoretical framework that can help us 
understand our difficult clients. And I'm going to move on. This slide illustrates, uh, it goes back to that Waddington slide of developmental pathways. I like to give the example of the little kangaroo Joey that has to make its way from the birth canal up into the pouch at this very immature uh, stage of its life. And it is incredibly vulnerable that, uh, make, when making that transition. And I believe that our clients that we're asking, as it were, to move from insecure attachment to secure attachment in the therapeutic relationship feel that it's so threatening and so dangerous that they have to test us and test us and test us until they feel that it really is safe to enter our therapeutic pouch, as it were. Now, this is just, that's T.S. Eliot. These are phrases from T.S. Eliot. We're back to the idea of words and language and virtually all therapies of course, are essentially verbal. It's not the whole story at all, as I've been illustrating before, but nevertheless, in the way we, in the end, we're talking to our clients. And attachment have got some interesting things to say about this, based essentially on work of Mary Main, who developed the adult attachment interview. The adult attachment interview is essentially a psychotherapy interview in which clients are asked about their relationship with their parents and any difficulties, separations, threats, or traumas that occurred in childhood. And what's important is that Mary Main focused not on content, but on style, how the person talked about their life, not what they said. And that's highly relevant, I believe, to us as therapists, because we tend to get a bit sort of hooked on the content. Ah, oh, this person experienced sexual abuse. That explains everything. Actually, it's the way in which someone, as it were, deals with that experience and the way in which they talk about it that's relevant. And Marianne drew on the work of the philosopher Grice, who was very interested in what is effective communication. And effective communication has these four aspects that I show on that slide. I think I'd particularly focus on freshness. Freshness is a very difficult thing to kind of uh, elaborate on. But nevertheless, I think what we're all the time trying with our clients is to have a kind of fresh conversation, something new, something new will emerge, as well as the other aspects that they're coherent um, and relevant, and that they speak neither too much nor too little. We're all familiar with a client who on the one hand, as it were, you ask them about their childhood and just say it was a normal ch childhood. That tells you nothing. Or conversely, where a, ch a client just talks and talks and talks and you can't quite work out are they talking about now or then or um, there's no kind of coherence to it. And I believe that we as therapists are all the time trying to shape our clients' um, discourse in the direction of these secure autonomous uh, uh, narratives that may remain associated with secure attachment. And again, I would believe and think that that applies across the board to all therapies. And those are the kinds of things that we as therapists say. So we can think about speech as not just conveying the communication uh, about information. You know, well, I had four siblings, that's just telling you information. But speech is also an act. This client is, as it were, acting in relation to you. And they're either going to act in a kind of interactive way or they're going to act in a rather, uh, uh, if you like, autonomous or separated way. And our job as therapists is to foster this interactive communication because it's that that's associated with secure attachment. And this is a study that's looked at psychotherapy uh, aspects. Now, another thing that I think is um, common to all therapists and therapies is this concept of reflexivity, the capacity, as it were, to be able to understand yourself and understand others and the attachment researcher Peter Fonagy, whose name I'm sure you're very familiar with, developed this, developed this notion of mentalizing to capture that. My definition of mentalizing um, is to see oneself from the inside, sorry, to see others from the inside and to see oneself from the outside. And I believe that what we're trying to do in therapy is to foster this capacity. I and mean, even if you're a systemic therapist um, working with families, then again, you're trying to help families to see one another's point of view, if you like. Well, that is to see others from the inside and not to be fixed. And I noticed that our, uh, my, one of my co 
speakers is going to be talking about flexibility. And in a way, what we're talking about here is flexibility, the ability to move, not from just one single way of thinking about yourself and the world and others, but to be able to entertain a number of different ways of thinking about yourself and the world and others. And this is a, cl a classic study on mentalizing, essentially showing that the capacity to mentalize protects you from adversity in childhood, so that people who've had adverse childhood experience, if they can mentalize, then they can overcome it. And after all, in a way, that's what we're doing with therapy, because we can't change people's experience. All we can do is to help them to think about it in different ways, in a more flexible way. I usually give this example. Um, this is a head louse, and that takes me on to Robert Burns' famous um, poem, Ode to a Louse, which I believe was stimulated by this um, man who's very much of a womanizer, which was perhaps something one shouldn't approve of, but he sees this beautiful girl with lovely hair, he, he's particularly keen on hair, and then he suddenly notices a louse uh, uh, crawling across her hair, and that stimulated this uh, idea which for me encapsulates the essence of mentalizing. Oh, would some power, the gift you give us, to see ourselves as others see us? It would from many a blunder free us and foolish notion. Well, I believe that's essentially the work that we do as therapists, whatever our theoretical basis. And I believe particularly in psychoanalytic psychotherapy, we can think of therapy as learning to mentalize. Freud, as you probably know, said to all his clients, I'm sorry about the squeaking I'm just changing my position. I'll try and stay still. Freud said, say anything that comes, everything that comes into your mind, however embarrassing or irrelevant it may seem. And I usually give the example of how do you teach someone to play a card game? Well, you teach them to play a card game, not by handing them a book of rules, but by playing the card game hands up for the first two or three rounds. And this is a wonderful metaphor, I believe, for what we're doing when we're learning to mentalize. Because in one sense, all of us are opaque to one another, unless we engage or play games with one another. And it's through that engagement and playing games that we come to learn and understand one another. But there's still this opacity. And what we're doing in therapy is we're breaking down that opacity because we're playing the game, the mentalizing game, hands up. And I think the same applies to us as therapists. Of course, we don't talk about our own, what's going on in our lives, our money lives, our love lives or whatever. But any thoughts or feelings that occur to us in relation to the client, it's, our, it's incumbent upon us to bring into the therapy session. I usually give the example of uh, at the end of a session one day, I suddenly thought to myself, oh dear, I must remember to get a bottle or a pint of milk on my way home. And then I realized I was talking to a client just before a break and that they were probably feeling very deprived and there wouldn't be any, as it were, therapeutic milk available for the next few weeks. And so I was able to use that, if you like, counter-transference uh, expression in my own mind to discuss that with the client. This um, little picture is really about, again, back to affect co-regulation. Um, the fact that we're working together with our clients, whatever our uh, theoretical background. So here we've got a frog in a bucket who's going bark, bark, bark. And then we have to visualize a little two-year-old and a caregiver, a mother. And the two-year-old is excited, wants to find out what's going on in that bucket, but doesn't know whether it's safe or not to do so. So it makes eye contact with mum. And mum says, yes, it's a frog so the little child can go and explore it. So all the time, the exploration that goes on in therapy has this two-way aspect, whatever the model. And this is a study where uh, children a bit older, three, four, were shown pictures of hybrid animals and asked to say, is that a squirrel or is it a, a cat? And the, the central message of this is that it's, in secure attachment, the child has a mind of his or her own. Whatever the mother says it is, the mum says it's a cat, the child will say, no, but it's got a squirrel's tail, whereas insecure children find this much more difficult. And again, all the time, I think we're trying to develop with our clients this sense of trust, this what Peter Fonagy calls epistemic trust, where the client, with our help, begins to develop a mind of his or her own.
And finally, let's say something about change promotion in this section. And I think we're already moving in that direction. Um, what I'm suggesting is that in all therapies, the client, as it were, borrows the therapist's brain in order to uh, try to solve his or her own problems. And there's a two, two kind of stages to this. First of all, we enter into the client's world. We learn their idiolect. We learn their special um, language. Um, now, what do we mean by idiolect? Well, idiolect is um, the kind of conversations that you have with your nearest and dearest. Uh, I might say to my wife, oh dear, that was a typical Sainsbury's situation. Now, what on earth does that mean? It could mean anything. It could mean that we, our eye, we met in Sainsbury's, our eyes met over the baked bean counter. It could mean that we had a terrible row in Sainsbury's. It could mean that we filled up a huge trolley full of stuff and then we discovered we hadn't bought a, any money. There's an idiolect there. That term Sainsbury's situation means something specific to us that it doesn't mean to anyone else. And it's that that we start to develop with our clients so that after a few weeks, as it were, we have this private language. And so we kind of go along with our clients, but then at a certain point, we, as it were, have to disagree. We have to create some sort of tension and how that tension is resolved is the key to change. So we create a kind of slightly chaotic situation, but that then can lead to more complex and more flexible um, psychological structures. And again, I would argue that's exactly what we do, whatever our theoretical background. We create surprise, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to now um, move on a bit um, that's a picture of um, Emma Darwin and Charles Darwin. I'm going on to the neuroscience um, uh, aspect of my talk in the last 20 minutes or a quarter of an hour or so. But I'm showing you couples. So we've got Emma and Charles Darwin. We've got John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. I'm talking about, and we could have therapist and patient. I'm talking about the way in which we create, as it were, a joint brain with another person in order to create new structures. Um, I'm going to skip over that just because of time. Now there's another couple, there's Charles Darwin again. There's Charles Darwin and the other face is the face um, of Gregor Mendel. Now we all know who Charles Darwin was, we do all know who Gregor Mendel was because we all learned about wrinkled and smooth peas when we were doing biology at school. Gregor Mendel, Mendel was a, an obscure Austrian monk who is the founding father of modern genetics. Darwin never heard of Gregor Mendel. He had no idea really how genetics works, but he did know that species, or he did discover, or did argue that species evolved by natural selection, even though he didn't really know what the mechanism was. And but the analogy I'm drawing is that Freud actually kind of knew that psychotherapy works and helps people who are in distress to get better. But he had no real idea about what the mechanism was. He had his own theories, but there was no basis for them. And I'm now going to suggest in this last 10, 15 minutes that Carl Friston's idea about free energy can help us think about what are the underlying neurological mechanisms which produce change in psychotherapy. Now, the point about this picture, other than the fact that it's one of my favorite pictures of the 20th century, is that it's a combination of chaos and structure. So we have a rectangle, a firm rectangle, but in the middle of that rectangle is chaos. Now, uh, let me elaborate on that. A famous um, uh, physicist, mathematician, Owen Schrodinger, who's seen as the founding father of modern quantum theory, wrote a wonderful book published in 1944 called What is Life? Now, because he was a physicist, he was aware of the second law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics says that in general, the universe is moving in the direction of uniformity and chaos. The exception, said Schrodinger, was life. Life goes in the opposite direction. It's not entropic. Entropy is a word or a measure of 
chaos and disorganization. Schrodinger said life is negentropy. That's to say it moves in the direction of order and structure. Now, of course, in the end, we all end up entropically as disorder and chaos. But we start off and our whole life is moving in this direction of order and complexity and non-chaos, if you like. And in a way, what we're doing with our clients is helping them back onto this negentropic conveyor belt, if you like. Carl Friston, who's a contemporary neuroscientist, has picked up on this idea. And his idea is that this negentropic concept applies to the brain as well as to the whole organism. That we, our brain, is all the time trying to create order out of chaos. Just think about what's happening right now to you. Sounds are hitting your ears, vibrations of uh, sound waves, and light is hitting the back of your retina. And you're making sense of those chaotic sensations. You're turning them into meaning. And Friston's idea is that the brain is all the time trying to avoid what he called free energy, which is, if you like, chaos. How does it do this? Well, his model is a top-down, bottom-up model. So if we think about bottom-up, we think about the sensations that are hitting our nervous system. The mind is bombarded with sensations, both from extraceptors, our five sept uh, senses, and from within, our gut, our heart, our proprioception. So all these sensations are coming into the nervous system and they have to be made sense of. And how do we do it? We make sense of it top down. How do we make sense of it top down? We draw on previous models of the world and we guess the extent to which it's relevant. And all the time we're trying to minimize the discrepancy between the chaos of what's coming in and what we know already. And we do this by trying all the time to eliminate surprise or free energy. Think about the visual system. Um, if you see a, a cat out of the corner of your eye, you don't, as it were, see that cat de novo. You build on the fact that you've probably seen hundreds of cats in your life and you have a pre-existing model. So all you have to do is to match, as it were, what's coming down from the top with the vague outline, perhaps the tail, the whiskers, the ears, and you just say to yourself, ah, cat. And what you're interested in is anomalies. So, for instance, you might be very, very familiar with your own cat and therefore not pay it much attention. But supposing there's a strange cat that comes into your living room or your garden, then you will suddenly be alerted. There's something new. There's an anomaly. I believe we're a bit like that as therapists because we have pre-existing models of what a person is like, what a man is like, what a woman is like, what a family is like, what a health, psychological health or psychological ill health is like. What we're on the, out, what we're on the lookout for are anomalies. And so I'd say one of the key features of effective therapists, whatever their theoretical background, is as anomaly detectors. So we listen to the client and let's say they talk about their childhood and they give a very good account of their mother, their siblings, their schooling, the difficulties which occur to them, but there's no mention of father. The anomaly detector is activated in the therapist who then says, well, just repeats what I've said. I've heard a lot about your mom and your, kid, your siblings and about your marriage, about your work. No mention of dad. So what Carl Frost, for instance, sees this, this is how the brain works. We've got a pre-existing model of the world there. And that's very different, I think, to the way in which, in a conventional sense, we tend to think of the way the brain works. We tend to think that it is a kind of camera that simply reflects what's out there in the world. It's not like that at all. We have a pre-existing model of the world with which we try to correlate whatever it is that um, the input provides us with. 
And just to give some neurological support to this, there are more top-down fibers to the visual system than bottom up. That's to say the brain's telling the eye what it's seeing more than the eye's telling the brain what's going on out there. Another way of thinking about this, uh, I think during lockdown, jigsaw puzzles have become very popular, I believe. And think about how much more difficult it would be to recreate that particular jigsaw if you weren't aware of the picture that you're aiming at. So we have a kind of pre-existing model, which is the picture on the box, as it were, and that's what enables us to assemble the jigsaw together. And that applies to um, the way the brain works generally. Um, it works in a kind of hierarchical way. So we go from the eye um, up to uh, the more primitive parts of the brain and all the way up to the cortex and all the way up actually prefrontal cortex and all the way up to consciousness. So the brain is automatically telling us what's going on in the world and enabling us up to operate in the world. And it's only that um, unexplained aspect, ah, that's a cat I've never seen before, that enters our consciousness. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip that slide. Now, the important point about this from, for us as psychotherapists is that the fact uh, that we are more effective at this anomaly detection, at this binding of free energy, if we've got someone to help us. And this is what Carl Friston and Chris Frith call duets for one. Um, Chris Frith did an interesting study, a very simple study. He took individuals, put them in front of the computer screen, and uh, gave them liminal or subliminal, just visible uh, dots of light on that uh, computer screen, and then asked the subject to say, well, did you see a dot of light or didn't you? And surprisingly, we're not particularly good at that. We only get it right about 50 or 60% of the time. What he then found was if you put two individuals together and then they start working collaboratively, then their success rate goes up massively to about 80%. And I believe what's going on here is, and what's going on in psychotherapy is that, as it were, the client borrows the therapist brain to start to think about and bind the free energy which is coming in. And I'll go back to that baby and that mother. Think of the mother who is asleep in bed. The baby wakes up in the night. The baby's crying. The baby just feels some kind of distress or pain. Mum gets, or dad gets out of bed, puts their own issues to one side. You know, they've got to get to work at six in the morning and maybe feeling completely exhausted. They go to the baby and they then have a conversation with the baby, a non-verbal or possibly verbal conversation. Are you too hot? Are you too cold? Have you had a bad dream? Do you need a feed? All the time, as it were, co-regulating the baby's feelings, the baby has borrowed the caregiver's brain to begin to understand and alleviate their distress. And that's what's happening in psychotherapy, I believe. And that's what's happening here neurologically in that free energy is more effectively bound with the help of another. One of the key differences, um, a really interesting uh, the primate research of Tomasello, it's very interested in the differences between human infants and great ape infants. And age one, cognitively, great apes are no less talented than small children. What's different is that we draw on others that were a collaborative species. So we have to think in terms of two-person neuroscience, what I'm calling the borrowed brain, what we might call the we go, the togetherness. This is a, a study I'm rather fond of that illustrates this point. Jim Cohen and his colleagues in Maryland put an advertisement in the local paper asking for happily married couples, 150 applied. They were told the study would have a small fee. Um, so that was the incentive and that it was an fMRI study. He then gave them a questionnaire to pick out about the 50 most happily married couples. My wife and I did for the others four, I don't think it would have been included in the study. And then uh, the study essentially involved the wife in the fMRI scanner under three conditions, holding her partner's hand, holding a stranger's hand and on her own, 
And she's then told, she's then given a threat. She's told that at some point in the next 20 seconds, you will receive a small electric shock to your left leg. And then he looked at the uh, uh, HPA axis. He looked at the hypothalamus, which is the kind of um, uh, alarm system of the brain. And unsurprisingly, while holding husband's hand, the alarm system is far less activated. So she borrows her husband's brain. He deals with the incoming sensations, the anxiety, the threat. And so she can, as it were, not have to waste brain power at dealing with this free energy, she can leave it to the other individual. And that's, that seems to me what's going on in psychotherapy of all sorts. Here, um, uh, 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 Jim was a bit worried that this study would be picked up by the alt-right and Christian community to say, well, there you are, it's the happy marriage is the only answer to everything. He did the same study with gay couples and found an even more um, marked effect. It's the dog that didn't bark in the night. So collaborative free energy binding and prediction error minimization is the answer. So just to summarize what I've been trying to say, I think um, key psychotherapeutic skills which apply to all forms of therapy include this shared attention, this capacity to develop um, a therapeutic idiolect, or what I call linguistic mutualism, Triple listening, listening to the other person, listening to oneself, listening to the other person, and seeing how whatever it is that one says impacts on the other. And the capacity to mentalize, to see oneself from the outside and the other from the inside. And in the consulting room, being able to experience pain, fostering free association, in other words, enabling these bottom-up sensations to be attended to, and in psychoanalytic psychotherapy, offering a kind of ambiguity, because it's the ambiguity which reveals the top-down assumptions. Um, yes, this is just a couple of slides illustrating ambiguity and how, um, whether you see a beautiful girl or a horrible old hag, probably says something about you. The most famous picture in the world illustrates ambiguity, uh, what is the Chaconda's smile, and that again tells us what our top-down assumptions are. So bottom up, we're all getting the same sensation, but we haven't got a kind of top-down model to match with that, so it creates free energy, which then um, is an anomaly, which then activates our attention. And that's exactly what I believe what goes on in therapy. And we're all the time trying to modify these deeply embedded um, assumptions about the world and to think of other possible explanations for things. This is the flexibility that perhaps you'll be hearing about after lunch. Uh, borderline personality disorder, the difficult patients from this free energy perspective, no borrowed brain, no counterfactuals. So you can think of flexibility in terms of thinking about other, other ways of thinking about a particular situation, counterfactuals no uh, capacity to press the pause button and slow down. And there is the pause button being pressed. I'm going to press my pause button in a second. And we have to move, as it were, from insecure attachment to earned security. So we're trying to move our clients from this free energy, which creates a kind of pain, unbound energy, to co-regulated surprise. And that, those two pictures illustrate what I've been trying to say for the last hour and a half. And between them, they add up to resilience. And that's the end of my talk. I'm sorry, I have gone on a couple of minutes longer than I should have done. But um, Niall, over to you and over to a bit of a discussion. I, I, I mean, I'm very happy to do Q&A and elaborate on some of the points I've been making, but I'm also interested in a more kind of free associative response. Um, well, thank you very much for an excellent presentation, Professor Holmes. I think people got a lot from that. Um, so, so thank you. Um, the first question we've got here is from uh, Jan, Jan Paulden. So Jan asks, what do you think of Patricia Crittenden's dynamic maturational model of attachment, which she claims is an explanatory framework for all of psych psychopathology? Um, well, I mean, um, Crittenden has done some very important research and far be it from me to in any way sort of disagree with her. 
Um, I'm always a bit suspicious of sort of totalizing explanations. Um, and her circumplex model, um, you know, has a kind of um, helpful explanation, uh, helpful aspect to it. But I think I would go back to what I was saying about diagnosis. I mean, she's very keen, as it were, to narrow uh, a particular attachment uh, style down to some very specific uh, bit of her attachment circumplex quadrant. And that can be very relieving for clients, but it can also be rather reifying. So um, I absolutely uh, um, admire her um, and her capacity to really take uh, attachment ideas into the consulting room, but I would have that one reservation about it. But thank you for mentioning Pat Crittenden because I, she deserves a mention and I didn't mention her. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the next question is from Kerry. Um, what would be a brief explanation for when the caregiving mechanism is overactivated and the clients only tend to the needs of others at the detriment to themselves from an analytic point of view? And that's a great question and opens up a whole day because, of course, this. So what we're looking at here is what's sometimes known as the compulsive caring syndrome. Um, and of course, we see it in our clients, but of course, we also see it in ourselves. And it's a disorder that we need to guard against in ourselves. And obviously, some people are, as it were, drawn to the kind of work that we do. Um, and um, I sometimes get told off by my wife, you know, for being over helpful, as it were, um, both to strangers and to members of the family. So, what's going on there? Um, I think um, it, 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 there is a real issue here. Well, there are two issues that I want to raise that I haven't touched on in my talk. One is the role of father as opposed to mother. And Bowlby, I think, was rightly criticised that he, it, certainly his original work, didn't say much about the role of fathers. And um, there, has been, there has been research on the role of fathers in attachment, and um, uh, uh, Klaus and Karen Grossman, uh, two wonderful German researchers, particularly have done some interesting work here. And they do, um, they, they show how dads are secure attachment figures, but they provide that security in slightly different ways. Mm. Now this was, this may be a little bit away from the question, but I, I just want to throw this in and then come back to the question. So um, in the early days of attachment, it was really important to establish that a child at age one, one and a half, could be securely attached to one parent and insecure to another and vice versa. Secure attached to dad, insecure mum or the other way around. Because this suggested that attachment style and attachment patterns are not temperamental. They're not something that's just to do with that infant. They are relational. So that's the first point. Secondly, if you watch dads soothing their children, they do do it in slightly different ways. So if you do the strange situation with a dad, um, and then he reunites with the child. He doesn't always do this kind of soothing, giant, grand, gradual sort of um, assuagement of the attachment dynamic. He may just sort of say, hey, look at that over there. Or have you seen that ball over there? That kind of distraction technique. That's one point. And I think there is a kind of sense in which dads are important insofar as they give this kind of you can do it message. Now, coming back to the question, which is, I think about compulsive caregiving. Um, clearly, this can be um, a, a sort of pathology of attachment where this you can do it aspect is um, neglected. So um, we have to think that as therapists, our job is, as it were, to provide a kind of springboard for our clients to be able to launch themselves once they've acquired some of the skills that they, interpersonal skills that we're offering in therapy into the outside world. And that's why I rather like this um, etymology of consilience that I mentioned right at the beginning, because I think those of us who are attending this seminar are clearly wanting to think about metatherapy, wanting to think about integrative therapy. And it does involve a kind of risk taking. Consilience means jumping together. I was thinking that famous moment where Robert Redford, and I couldn't remember who the other uh, actor was, jump off a cliff um, in a famous film that probably dates me. But um, 
the, the point uh, I'm trying to make here is that um, you have both, as it were, to be able to activate your attachment dynamic when you need it, but you also need to have some kind of internal sense of security that enables you to make this leap, this leap forward, this exploration aspect. So I don't know if that quite answers your point, um, but that's a few thoughts on the subject anyway. Great, thank you very um, much. You, oh, no, there was one other thing I wanted to mention, that's right. Um, uh, this is another sort of critique of attachment theory, which is that it's very sort of Western centric. centric. I mean, I did use this term weird, which is now gaining currency because of the book um, uh, about this Western industrialized, educated, rich, um, and democratic. Um, and if you look sort of more anthropologically across the world, then um, to use what's a bit of a cliche, it takes a village to raise a child. So the children are actually looked after by multiple caregivers, not just by mum, dad, but by mum, dad, grandparents, older siblings. Um, in our sort of Western cultures, of course, uh, childminders. And um, so that kind of may mitigate this compulsive caregiving aspect. It may make the child realise that there are multiple, there's always someone you can turn to if you need a bit of help. So that's another sort of more anthropological answer to your point. But anyway, um, let's have another thought or comment or disagreement. Um, I'm just curious to ask, in your, in your uh, course you did with us last year, start of last year, you talked a lot about the importance of the therapist providing an, an ambiguous stimulus for clients. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe expand a bit more about the importance of that and maybe go into that a bit more? Yes. Uh, I didn't, um, very, I kind of glossed over it, didn't I? And I didn't have uh, uh, enough time for that. Well, um, I think we're all familiar, certainly those of us with an analytic background, um, about uh, the need for a degree of opacity in therapists. In other words, I mean, obviously the client comes to see you, they can tell what your gender is, they can tell um, what your age is, um, they can tell sort of what kind of person you are from the room you offer and the books that are on the shelves. Um, they can probably tell if you're wearing a wedding ring, whether you're married or not. Um, so uh, there are quite a few sort of, uh, as it were, subliminal things that they get to know about you anyway. But equally, of course, um, we, at least as uh, analytic psychotherapists, um, want to remain somewhat opaque. So if the client sort of said, I don't know, are you married or how many kids have you got or are your parents still alive? I mean, you're not going to answer those questions directly. Um, you might be more likely to say, well, that's a really interesting question, but let's think about where that question's coming from. I mean, I think, um, and I'm going to say something, sorry, there's going to be an aside, but I'll just st come back to, to Niall's point uh, first. So um, there is a kind of way in which we do offer a kind of ambiguous stimulus. Now, why? What's the importance of that ambiguous, ambiguous stimulus? Well, the importance of that ambiguous stimulus is that a client then is going to make assumptions. Oh, you know, you're just a typical, um, uh, I don't know, middle class Tory voter or something like that. Um, which may or may not be true. You may be a typical middle class Tory voter or you might be a passionate green. Um, so where does that come from? That's a top-down assumption about you that's used to deal with the free energy that the therapeutic relationship engenders. And if we press the pause button, which is essentially what one is doing, and one says, well, that's a really interesting question, or I wonder where you get that idea from. What is it about me that makes you assume that I'm a typical Tory? Whatever. Um, and then they might say, well, it's your accent or, you know, um, the books on your shelves or, well, you, you know, you therapists are all the same. So then you might say, well, it sounds though you're assuming that people who are looking after you or trying to help you are intrinsically really just doing their own thing, are really interested in you. Now I wonder where that idea comes from. In other words, the ambiguity that the therapist uh, offers enables the client to begin to see their own assumptions about the world. 
their own top-down models that they bring. And going forwards to the, to the presentation we're going to have later today, the moment you do that, you're introducing flexibility. You're introducing the idea that, okay, I'm seeing the world in this way. Maybe there's another way in which I can see the world. Maybe there are what I'm calling counterfactuals. Maybe I should explain and explain what I mean by a counterfactual. Counterfactual is actually a phrase that, as far as I know, was invented by historians. And it's what would happen if Napoleon had won the Battle of Waterloo? What, uh, and uh, of course, Richard Harris has written a book um, about what would have happened if Hitler had won and um, the UK had uh, come under German rule. These counterfactuals are what we're doing all the time. We're, we have a kind of range of possible. Uh, explanations for what's going on in the world. And the wider that range is, the less stuck we are in our illness, let's say. I mean, I like to make a bit of a sort of comparison here with uh, vaccination, because what's happening in vaccination is that the immune system is, as it were, being given a wider range of antigens to which it can respond. And I believe that in therapy, by developing these counterfactuals, and it isn't just therapy, because that then links therapy with a whole cultural range of things, such as um, the arts, um, music, theatre, television, etc. These are all providing a kind of range of different stories, which we can then use to help us navigate through life. And I believe the same applies to dreams, so that dreaming also provides counterfactuals. It provides a, a, a kind of a, a repository, a store, as it were, of narratives which we can then apply or makes us not feel totally overwhelmed by experience and what's interesting is if you think about trauma trauma essentially is a negative experience for which you have no model and therefore it's overwhelming it means that free energy suffuses your entire psychic system and what we're trying to do in therapy, we're working with, th with traumatized individuals, is to begin, as it were, to tell the story of this trauma. So I don't know if that um, answers your point, Neil. And there was something I wanted to say, which I actually got, uh, I managed to forget in the course of going on like that. But never mind. That's fascinating. This, the trauma is a is a negative experience for which we have no model. I never thought thought of it like that before, but that's a really really interesting perspective on it. Um. We've got one here from Patty. Patty asks, to, to achieve a healthy attachment in the therapeutic relationship, the first and last five to 10 minutes are important. Do you have any practical tips on how to build trust with the client uh, or patients in this, in, this, in this window? Yes, I mean, I think what I'm saying, it's very exciting what I'm saying, but I do think this contingency and marking in the first five minutes, well, five minutes, just an arbitrary length of time, you need to be incredibly sensitive to is the client in a state of attachment dynamic? Are they just feeling incredibly anxious? And therefore, they're not going to hear what you're going to say. We all know this. You can't hear if you're in a state of fight or flight or freeze, anything. All you're doing is trying to preserve your life, as it were. And I think our clients in the early stages of therapy and maybe in the early stages of each session are a little bit like that. So um, that's why. I think we just have to be incredibly sensitive to what's going on in the client and to be make our responses very contingent to that and in a way simply to reinforce and underline uh, so you might just say well um you know i think you find just coming in here and sitting down on that chair or lying on that couch an incredibly threatening and difficult experience the last five minutes of sessions are really interesting because i didn't know about you um, but I often sort of come up with some brilliant idea that I want to sort of shove into the client before they leave the session. Um, but uh, uh, that is unlikely to be effective, I think I'd say, um, because the end of a session is also threatening. So I, I tend to, first of all, give clients a, a bit of a warning, not always, but I might say, well, we're, we're getting quite near the end of the session. We've got another couple of minutes and to be more in a kind of listening mode at the end of the session, but give a message to oneself I, uh, uh, so that one might say to the client, well, look, I think we're 
discussing something really important here. Let's not let's not lose it. Maybe we'll come back to it um, next time. So there's a you know as I say, I don't think I'm saying anything that any therapist wouldn't say, um, but perhaps giving a bit of a sort of an attachment gloss on that aspect. Very interesting. Now, a big part of all this is, you know, this concept of the secure base. And I'm just curious to ask, how changeable is the secure base throughout the lifespan? Because I've heard Paul Gilbert, are you, are you aware of his work? Oh, right, right. Yes, of course. No, 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 absolutely. Um, I, I just, um, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard him talk I'm about, sorry. you know. Conferences and uh, Paul is a friend of mine. No. Uh, or colleague friend. Um, no, I think what I would want to say about that is um, two, two or three points. Um, first of all, um, if we look at the research on resilience, some people manage to survive appalling childhood trauma of one sort or another, physical sexual abuse and neglect. What is it that enables them to survive? Well, it is often one good relationship with a grandparent, possibly a teacher, could be a child psychotherapist. So a secure base um, and a secure base dynamic may have to, as it were, shift from the primary caregiver to another person. That's the first point. Secondly, absolutely, we need to look at this developmentally. We need to look at it in a life history context. And clearly what happens in adolescence is that the parent um, sort of in a way begins to move into the background and the peer group begins to create or to assume some of the features of the secure base, but not all of them. And so I think in, in uh, development generally, the parent is still there in the background and the adolescent um, may need, as it were, to come home either physically or emotionally when things get difficult in the peer group situation. And then, of course, um, there is forming an attachment, forming a relationship, forming a spousal type relationship in one's 20s or 30s. And then, as it were, there's a shift from uh, uh, the parent to whoever it happens to be. But there are huge variations on this. I mean, siblings may become um, uh, assume the role, an older sibling may assume the role of the secure base if there's been some uh, family trauma. Um, and uh, uh, actually, I think of Charles Darwin, his mother died when he was eight, and I believe one of his older siblings looked after him that way. If we think about Wordsworth and Dorothy Wordsworth, the same is true. And then, of course, at a certain point, and of course, I'm not far from that certain point. Um, as old age um, looms, then there may be a reversal and there the child may begin to assume the role of the secure base um, uh, for the parent. So absolutely, um, these uh, there are variations in this. I think the key point, and maybe this is one which we should think about ending on or near, is that this is not something that's outgrown. There is always, throughout the life cycle, an individual or a group of individuals to whom one turns when faced with threat, illness, or exhaustion. Um, and this is a kind of um, uh, explicit, if you like, in small children, and it may become explicit, explicit in um, sans everything stage of one's life in old age, whereas it's kind of latent in adult life, but it only takes a trauma or I would say some great moment of happiness to reactivate this cure base. It's really interesting. Um, one of the things Paul talks about, um, I think one of his colleagues, Deborah Lee, they, they do work with uh, people returning from war, so veterans, and they will, um, whenever they, they're at war and whether they're in Iraq or Afghanistan or whatever, their secure base becomes their troop, their tribe. And then whenever they return home, obviously that's, that's been so strongly kind of wired. I don't know if wired is the right word. And then whenever they return home, their secure base isn't there. So they feel like anxious in day-to-day -day life and they feel like, and they resort to drinking and stuff. And are you, are you aware of this work? And what yes, are your thoughts on I that? Think, um, the whole concept, concept of PTSD was developed at the Vietnam War 
um, and was de de developed in relation to Vietnam vets, and I'm sure that's uh, very true. Um, <laughs> those of us who are watching uh, uh, European football um, might notice that something similar may apply to footballers and their team and their manager as well. So I think you do get, get this, well, I did mention this actually at the beginning of my talk, you do get this horizontal um, secure base relationship um, in extreme situations such as war. Um, there's no doubt about that. And, and again, I think extreme situations may occur in families where siblings, um, you know, it's a very, very dysfunctional family with dysfunctional parents and siblings may assume this role for one another. 100%. Well, Professor Holmes, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you uh, give this talk with us today. I think everybody's really enjoyed it. So, so thank you. Um, just before you go, um, your new book, The Brain Has a Mind of Its Own, where can people get this? I think it's available via Confer. Is that That's right? On, on my last slide, I think the two books, um, the two most recent books are uh, sort of... I'll just, I'll just put these up here again here quickly before we end. Um, and any any other uh, recommendations for people before you go anywhere, anywhere to go online or anything to check out? Um, well, I mean, I would probably pursue this idea of psychotherapy integration. There is, there is a literature on psychotherapy integration. Um, and um, I think it's rather out of date now, but I, as I said, I did uh, edit a book with Anthony Bateman. It came out in 2002 on psychotherapy integration, which was a series of essays by people from different psychotherapy backgrounds, systemic CBT, um, psychoanalytic, etc., cetera, um, all thinking about their own discipline in relation to a more wider context of psychotherapy integration. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Professor Holmes. I really appreciate it. Everybody else, we're back at uh, one o'clock with our second talk from Dr. Dennis Turch. So we'll see you guys all then. Thanks. Bye. And thank you for listening.